isang magandang nakikas ang hapon po sa ating lahat. We would like to thank Sherka and uh, for inviting us to share with you this afternoon the Philippine National Bread Plus Strategy and this is part of this is one of uh, we would like this is a privilege for us to really share this as part of creating awareness among the uh, society and other stakeholders. So, This is my outline. So I would be some introduction, then state of the Philippine forest, forest and climate change, and then responses to climate change, Philippine National Red Plus strategy is for the processes involved, and then of course the Philippine National Red Plus strategy components and the Red Plus developments or existing development or recent developments as far as the Red Plus strategy is concerned. So I guess everybody is aware now of the, uh, of the global warming and that there will be an increase, two percent increase in decrease centigrade average, annual increase in, in, in temperature, and I guess all of us are now experiencing globally. Uh, there was a flood in um, in Australia and other parts of the country, and even the Philippines experiencing this these things nowadays. So, so some of the causes of the global warming, I know that all of you are very aware of this, was as far as the energy use is concerned, uh, we have the fossil fuel, coal, oil, and natural gas, and unsustainable transportation, and of course, deforestation, which we will be dealing more of this. <coughs> Uh, the forestry sector, the forestry uh, contributes 17% of the total GHGs or G G GHGs in the, in the atmosphere. So, and uh, of course, forest plays a vital role as far as the climate change is concerned because uh, it absorbs uh, carbon dioxide in the air and uh, and of course, release oxygen in the atmosphere. So it helps us to re really reduce the, the pollution uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, as far as the Philippine forestry is concerned, the state of the forest is concerned, uh, we have a total land area of 30 million, and the remaining uh, forest covered now is only 7.2 million. So out of the 15 million hectares, only 7.2 million hectares, or 20% of the total land area is covered with forests. So, 36% uh, of which are, we call it closed forests, whereby when we, when we say closed forests, at least 40% of the forest canopy is, 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 is there. And of course, the open forest is 56%, which is about 4 million, and then the mangrove area is 3%, and the plantation forest is only 5%, so with a total forest cover of 7.2 million hectares. <clears throat> From 1969 to 1988, the Philippines is experiencing a net loss of 220,000 hectares annually. But uh, from 1988 to 2003, a net annual increase of 47,000 hectares per year, or 11% gain as far as the forest cover is concerned. So you would notice on the ground, um, the closed canopy is, is decreasing, but the open the closed canopy is decreasing, but the open areas are increasing. You know. Are, are increasing and the plantation is somehow somehow also gaining some some increase as far as the forest cover is concerned. But 30 over 81 provinces are experiencing deforestation. Although we have a, a decrease in the forest cover, um, we are also experiencing deforestation from the natural forest. So therefore uh, the problem here actually is the quality of forests that are remaining in the Philippines. So, the quality of forest natin. So, these are some of the provinces where we are experiencing a lot of deforestation. So, Busan del Sur, the mention some, Bukid Non, Surigao del Sur, and Sabuanga del Norte. 
and we have uh, about 6 million hectares of forest lands under the Community Forest Management or 4.7 million hectares are issued under tenure instruments. Um, the report of the FIP expert group um, uh, places the, the Philippines to be the carbon sink because we, we have a potential of 38.5 megatons from 2011 to 2030. So the Philippines is considered as a carbon sink. In responses to climate change, of course, uh, we have two, two uh, processes. We have the or approach, uh, responses to this. This is the adaptation and the mitigation approaches. So adaptation, adaptation is responding to changes that might occur from added carbon dioxide. So I guess uh, we are now at the point whereby what we will be doing is really to adapt adapt to the changes in the climate change, more of the adaptation in the climate change, although it's not either or, or argument, but we have to do both, both the practices, the mitigation process and the adaptation process so that we could address the increase in the, in the temperature that, in the atmosphere. So some of the adaptation practices could involve forest and mangrove protection and buffer zones, public infrastructure strengthening, education, and training and awareness. As far as mitigation is concerned, of course, reducing sources of carbon and for enhancing of carbon through reforestation, agroforestry, assisted natural regeneration, macro rehabilitation, soil and water, and soil and water conservation, to name a few. What is red plus? Uh, by the way, red is uh, means reducing emissions from degradation and deforestation. So we somehow reduce uh, the cutting of trees and also the, the, the cutting of trees in the natural forest as well. So yeah. that's the degradation and the deforestation. It is an umbrella term for local, national, and global actions that reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation and enhance for forest carbon stocks in developing countries. The plus refers to the enhancement of forest carbon stock, or which includes some forest regeneration and rehabilitation and carbon removal. So when we say red, uh, it means deforestation only. We only avoid uh, reduction of emissions from deforestation. Red, double red, uh, you avoid, um, you enhance, uh, you avoid uh, deforestation and degradation. Okay, and the red plus would include sustainable forest management. So this includes the conservation of existing carbon stocks to better management of forest and protected areas. So this includes some areas with uh, in biodiversity areas and also those areas with a natural forest, so that could be still be eligible for for red plus and the red plus. Why red? So red is not included in the current uh, clean development mechanism of the Kyoto Protocol, and the, for the first commitment period, um, it's only reforestation up and afforestation, which was included in the in the CDM, but. Uh, under the UNFCCC convention, there was an agreement of both nation states to take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which have been the cause of global warming. And, uh, and on CP15, there was a recognition for the need to provide methodological guidance for activities related to reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation and the role of conservation sustainable management of forests and enhancement of forest carbon stocks in developing countries. So there was already a recognition under the CP15 and under the CP16, uh, the uh, red plus, which is the new forest conservation mechanism was recognized. So um, it was agreed that there's a measure to provide positive in incentives to developing countries to slow down the rates of deforestation and forest degradation to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. So industrialized countries 
make financial transfers to developing countries to compensate them for opportunity and other costs of avoiding devastation. So um, there was a discussion around this that some the developing countries should also provide some assist or some funds for the the underdeveloped countries to for the activities on red plus or to support the red plus activities. Um, why red plus? Uh, because the Philippines has a great promise for red plus implementation in regards to potential to deliver co benefits as, as biodiversity conservation and ecological restorations. Because we have a past of, uh, we are one of the um, mega diverse countries in the world, and we could um, enroll the, this biodiversity under the red plus. A possible equitable distribution given this progressive pro community land tenure and forest management policy. So uh, we are, I guess the Philippines has an advantage over this because we have a long experience in community management and engaging communities as far as um, forest development is concerned. And of course, a strong civil society participation. In fact, I guess um, many uh, civil societies and NGOs are really involved as far as this um, forest conservation is concerned uh, up to this time. Towards the Red Plus uh, Ready Philippines. At the regional level, we just adopted the CN common position on the red, on red, on red plus. And at the national level, a group of um, uh, practitioners as well as civil societies and, and um, private sectors come together to come up with a, this national red plus strategy and they were able we were able to craft uh, some of the of these principles under the Philippine national red plus strategy to mention some support red plus mechanism promote uh, red plus towards the attainment of sustainable development and overall poverty reduction address the drivers of deforestation and forest degradation good governance the issue of permanence and generate and develop appropriate knowledge management system, build the, the capability of the stakeholders, equi ensure equitable, secure, and sustainable benefits sharing and sources of financing, um, support rights based approach to Red Plus, promote the recognition of biodiversity, ecosystem, and cultural values, uh, a functioning and credible MRB system or the measuring and, and reporting and verifying system, recognize the rise to carbon, pro to carbon projects within ancestral domains. So I will not be discussing the Philippine National Red Plus strategy and I would like to emphasize that this was done in partnership with various stakeholders. So, um, so I would like, okay. So I would like to emphasize how the process by which this uh, Philippine National Red Plus strategy has been formulated and this is, this was done not by the DNR alone but the various stakeholders. So um, NGOs were at the forefront uh, of the debates and discussion on red class were empowered at the time with resources focusing on red and that the civil society led by NGOs comprised of all POs, locals and I've expressed to, to the Philippine government actually the they are the ones who come to us and um, and tell us the urgency of developing guideposts to get the country engaged in red plus. And so um, the Philippine government and uh, and the different sectors agreed to come up with a with a framework. And uh, um, after which uh, we had organized consultations and several workshops to develop the national red plus strategies. So there was a resource mobilization from the NGO partners and also from donor partners and some counterpart counterparting of resources from government agencies. So there were some consultations and peer reviews. Over 500 persons were consulted uh, through the seven consultations on two reviews by experts. So, uh, this included national agencies, local agencies, NGOs, local institutions, even POs and community members. So, uh, so this uh, was the process that we underwent. So um, the 
Philippine the Philippine Natural Breakfast Strategy was completed and endorsed by the Department of Environment and Natural Resources to the Climate Change Commission. And but um, until now the the PRPS is with them and this will be incorporated in the uh, climate change uh, plan, the CCC CCC Cup or action plan of the National Commission, of the Climate Change Commission. So this will be incorporated there. So there will be a, a planning workshop again, a planning workshop tomorrow to incorporate the adaptation strategies as well as the PNRPS. So it's already there with the Climate Change Commission. And uh, of course, right now, the committees are were organized to to do the action planning for readiness and resource mobilization. So we are now crafting the, 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 the work and financial plan for this to be uh, implemented on the ground. So this is the approach. As I said earlier, there was a workshop in November 29, and then component workshop groups in December 2009, and then a right shop in March and draft written up by an integrator, we, we hired an integrator to do this, and then national presentation by April, on April 2010, and critic and review by experts on May to June 2010, and then finally, it was approved by the DNR endorsed the secretary. So that was the process that went through in the preparation of the National Red Plus strategy. So the National Red Plus strategy envisions to have an empowered forest managers sustainably and equitably managing forest and ancestral domains with enhanced carbon stock and reduced greenhouse gases emission. Within the vision framework, the impact areas include reduced forest degradation and deforestation, poverty alleviation, biodiversity conservation, and improved governance. So we also crafted the core values for you to remember this, just remember the acronym CREATE, which the C represents for care for the earth and life in this diversity. So we, we believe that um, there should be um, an improvement in the biodiversity and ecosystem and cultural values of the people and in the area, and also the address the drivers of, of deforestation. In terms of the respect for human dignity, um, we also we recognize the, the the people's organizations as well as the the IPs, and also uh, we believe that the red would enhance uh, would provide sustainable development of forest resources and address the poverty allegation and food security of the people. Encourage social responsibility, E stands for encourage social responsibility. We believe that through forest land use planning, these people or people in the uplands would be given the uh, uh, share in the area, in the forest land area, for them to manage it sustainably. And for them to be responsible for the areas which were given to them. For attainment of social justice, we uh, address here the women, address women, the IPs, and also equal share in the resources and, the, and in the benefit sharing. For transparency and accountability, and for us to be to have a good governance, and the E stands for empowerment through partnership and collaboration. So we believe that uh, through uh, capacity building and training, people will be empowered to really work and collaborate towards the attainment of the Red Plus. Key features of the National Red Plus strategy. Uh, the first one is the nested and scaling up approach. Um, this one, uh, we, don't, uh, we will be starting from small projects to learn lessons from this and eventually this would be scaled up at the provincial or the national level and up to the national level. So, so that uh, some of the, the methodologies that we, that we will be leading through the, as far as Red Plus is concerned, will be tested in a pilot base. Uh, priority development areas, uh, 
would be on the community tenured area. So uh, we already have some existing pilot projects whereby communities are already involved. And of course, community focus, multi-level governance approach, which would focus on decentralization and maximizing existing working mechanisms. So we believe that um, we will not be creating new structures, but we will be utilizing the existing structures of the field level. Of course, intersectoral coordination, and then participatory multi-stakeholder partnerships. So those were the key features. And um, rigorous uh, carbon accounting and watershed national ecosystems and landscapes, of course. We believe that if we do it in a restrict basis, more things would be would happen and more impact will be generated from this approach. <coughs> what are some of the components of the strategies? So we have the enabling policy, uh, governance, uh, research and development, uh, community and capacity build, communication and capacity building, resources allocation and management, MRB, and sustainable financing. So these are the the six, seven strategies or components of the national breadcast strategies. First, the the enabling policy would uh, actually um, builds more on the on carbon ownership and conflicting laws. So we are working some of the the laws to so harmonize some of the conflicting laws. There was there is now a study of really uh, uh, identifying some of those laws that we haven't and the uh, gap and the uh, overlapping and some gaps in the past in the policy as far as the policy is concerned. And of course the issue on the carbon ownership because um, right now some of the the actually there was a debate as who owns the carbon right now and uh, some are saying that the community should own the carbon. The government is saying that we have we should have a share that the DNA should have a share in that carbon. And even the local government units are saying that uh, we should have uh, a share of the carbon. So there is a study now ongoing, and hopefully we could uh, come up with this and come up with uh, <laughs> with uh, sharing sharing on the carbon, or be, will it be given directly to the communities or to the one managing the forest? So those are the questions that we will be probably we will be addressing as far as the enabling policy is concerned. So in terms of, of governance, um, uh, there, there is now a study, there is now an ongoing study on, on determining what appropriate structures should be established as far as, far as the as far as the red plus is, is concerned, the red plus study is concerned. And uh, will it be uh, some are thinking of creating a new structure along the line but some are also advocating that the existing structure should be used and this will be lodged under those structures so uh, there is also an ongoing study on this areas or will it be will the council or will the structure includes other uh, other or will it be done on a multi-stakeholders basis also like including the the NGOs and private sectors and all of that, uh, maybe our, maybe POs be included as one of the uh, represent or should be represented in the in the body. So those things are being considered right now and hopefully we will be able to come up with a functional structure for the national red class. Okay. And of course you what we are also looking at the benefit sharing scheme as, as I've said before uh, there are now some issues on the carbon ownership and I'm just discussing some of the highlights or, and some of the most important thing that the, the, the component um, includes. As far as the research and development and concern, uh, of course, the red class and the methodology for measuring carbon is, is, is being discussed here. And of course, the um, degradation, the drivers of degradation and reforestation and of course some policy and socioeconomic studies which are related to red plus. So those are the things that are being looked into in, as far as research and development is concerned. And uh, uh, 
um, would like to, I'm happy to tell you that um, the research institutions are, are, really, are very much involved in the crafting of this research and development component. So we have the FTC here, the research and other colleges, institutions, and research institutions who came together to really craft the, the, the strategies and the components and the activities under the research and development. But first, the communication and capacity building thing. So uh, we already um, we have uh, crafted also some of the strategies to capacitate our people here. And, uh, and this also includes the, um, the creation of the of the team to really to to share the information as far as red bus is concerned and also the knowledge management thing is also, is also included here. Uh, under the resources management this uh, will focus or address issues on land tenure, land use, uh, population management and re restoration and rehabilitation. Under the MRB um, increase uh, capacity on measuring carbon and carbon accounting, uh, having a credible data, especially so that our forest cover data is only 2003, and I believe that for, for us to have a good baseline data, we should be having um, uh, an updated uh, satellite image, and right now, um, actually, uh, the different agencies, like uh, the DADNR, NAMIA, and other sectors, are now coming together to buy a satellite image, a one satellite image for the country because in the past, Namibia is buying one, DA is buying one, and other sectors and other uh, institutions are also buying their, their satellite images. So right now, the DBM uh, pull all these resources for us to buy a new satellite image with 0.6 resolution. Now, but there was a failure in the bidding, so hopefully we will be able to purchase the 0.6 resolution for our forest for satellite images. This will be used in the analysis of the of the data that we have right now. So it's it's a it's a good thing that uh, different agencies and sectors are really working together now towards a common goal and a common vision. So and hopefully this would also address the our issue on the forest and boundary delineation on the forest property and all of that through the purchase of the satellite EVs. And then Amelia was, was tasked to do the analysis and analysis of the new satellite EVs with points of resolution. But that's, that will still be purchased this year. But right now, the Amelia has 80% um, Satellite image already, uh, but the data is in 2000, 2006 and 2008. So, but they will also be doing the ground validation for that data so that we could compare this with the 2003 data that we have. Meantime, that we are waiting for the 0.6 resolution that we have. So, uh, with that, we will be solving a lot of uh, problem as far as forest cover data is concerned and also some population. There's on the point six you can do point six, point six resolution you can already see uh, on the ground in, uh, the even the the trees on the, by the point six resolution, even people and structures. And it's just like a photograph. And of course, sustainable financing. So all these things will not run without the, the funds. So they are looking up of some financing schemes and explore different financing schemes and voluntary funding along this line. And, but we have a local fund uh, which are available here. So with or without funding from international uh, support, from international institute, uh, funding institutions, I, I guess, we should pursue with this red bus strategies. So those are some of the components and strategies of the NRPS. So as far as timeline is concerned, um, the PNRPS has a 10 year uh, duration and it is divided into three main phases. 
the, the readiness phase, scaling up, and the engagement engagement phase. As I said earlier, we will not proceed here at once, but we would like to have some preparatory and readiness activities first before we do the scaling up. So uh, under the readiness, we will be focusing on capacity building and communication and creating awareness among the, the people Establish the national bodies and, car and uh, carbon accounting. So the structure is very, very important for us to really proceed with the uh, implementation of this. And of course, establish uh, pilot demonstration sites within the provinces and regions and implement the readiness strategies. So there was uh, there will be an overlap between the scaling up and the readiness one, and the readiness strategy or red readiness space because some of the projects will be, uh, will be established earlier and some will be established here. So hopefully we can scale up by year 2013, we could start, or 12, we could start scaling up uh, from site level to provincial and regional levels and establish new sites. And hopefully by 2017 or 18, 17, we could not have a national engagement. So that's, that is the, the timeline as far as the Philippine Red Cross strategy is concerned. Uh, some of the recent developments, of course, uh, I hope everybody knows that there is now the, the an enactment of the Climate Change Act and creation of the Climate Change Commission. So we have, uh, the chair now is USEC Serene, um, but the uh, Herson Alvarez and Sunika, are, are still there. So they are still there. The three of them are still with the commission, um, but the chair now is Yusek Sili. But there was also um, an advisor to the president as far as climate change is concerned in the person of secretary, former secretary also. So, so the three of them are working together in tandem also with secretary also as the presidential advisor of climate change. And uh, there was also um, an executive order uh, adapting the National Red Cross strategy, and um, which designates uh, the DNR as the implementing arm for, as far as the Red Cross strategy is, is concerned. Under the executive order 881 of Red Cross, it appoints DNR as the operational head for Red Cross. So we also have some projects, projects uh, under the UN Red, but still in the pipeline. I, they said that it was already approved during the last past plan, policy board meeting, and it will, will be implemented this year. So it will be addressing some of the preparatory activities as far as uh, Red Plus is concerned, like structure and uh, MRB system, things like that. So we have also piloting in terms of determining baselines, carbon accounting and measurement, formulation of communication plan, and conduct policy studies. So there are some policy studies already ongoing, as I said earlier, linking communities to carbon market and awareness raising and capacity building. So uh, there are also some ongoing activities which is in, um, which the government is doing, like intensifying agroforestry, reforestation, and macro rehabilitation using the existing government funds. And right now, this year, I guess we will be we will be establishing around uh, seventy thousand hectares under the group funding uh, from the from the government from the government. And first, intensifying forest protection efforts. And the strengthening multi stakeholder forest protection committees, and of course the climate proofing of the forest forest sector plan. So those are some of the recent developments that we have as far as the red is concerned. So all these things are part of the forestry climate change strategy framework. So so under the uh, primary strategy, we have here the forest protection, forest restoration, sustainable management of forests, and third-party monitoring certification. Of course, 
some supporting strategies here which are includes institutions and human resources development. So these are some of the activities and strategies under this strategy. So our red class is is, is in line with the forestry climate change strategy framework. Thank you very much. Thank you, Forrester Wagan. We now welcome your questions, your comments. Please use the microphones around the room. Introduce yourself and uh, your organization. Any questions or comments from Forrester Wagan? Yes, Dr. Merka. I am Merka. I am Merka, I'm a septitologist. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. It is very broad. And, uh, for me, uh, I see it sometimes confusing. But uh, let me uh, uh, tell this in a simplistic form. Okay, then you have the forest, then uh, you have the people. Okay, then you have the, the natural deforestation caused by natural calamities. And the other portion of that is democratic, caused by humans. I do not see, but maybe it's hidden somewhere else in your program. The attack on uh, rehabilitating the people that including the forest, and then you have a year or even uh, after five years, you have a social kind of uh, evaluation on whether you are progressing or not progressing in uh, doing the right. So uh, actually, we, we, we have already um, developed our tools for determining whether we are progressing or not. We have the criteria indicators for sustainable development and uh, I guess we will be using those as a framework in determining whether we are progressing towards sustainable development or not. We, already crafted, we have already crafted uh, a tool for that and uh, uh, we will be using those indicators in determining whether we are progressing towards sustainable development. Any questions? Dr. Gattis. Thank you. But may I follow up on uh, Dr. Perka's uh, question on uh, the criteria for sustainable development? Uh, can you give examples of some uh, indicators on the on human uh, dimensions? <laughs> Actually, uh, we have seven criteria for sustainable development. So we have the, the policy, we have the biodiversity conservation. So those are the general criteria. So we have the social aspects and the watershed, biodiversity conservation, and land, land, land and land improvement. So seven, seven criteria along that line. And each criteria, we have several indicators uh, for each criteria. So we have here the area development or reduction in, in forest cover, or we have the increase in uh, increase in um, in a reduction uh, reduction in forest cover, increase in um, this is in biodiversity, the diversity of the forest. So those things are being looked into. So as far as the as far as social concern, as far as social aspect is concerned, we are looking at whether it has somehow helped reduce the the, or increase the income level of the communities or things like that. So there are 52 indicators within those seven criteria. criteria. And each criteria has specific indicators. I, it's, just, um, it's just unfortunate that I don't have it here. But we could uh, probably give you some of those uh, indicators that we have already identified. 52 indicators under the seven criteria. We have all those things. So, as far as the policy and institutional reform is concerned, so we are looking there as far as is there are an existing policies that are in, in, in place among the community. So, you are looking at, at uh, you measure you measure the this uh, whether a project or a project on an area is geared towards sustainable development by by really determining whether there is an existing uh, uh, structure to manage the the whole area where there are policies in place 
Are they doing it? Is there a management plan? And things like that. Is there, um, if you are, if you are measuring the, the IFMA, the IFMA, you are looking at their whether the, the, the company provides some, um, some good pay, <laughs> some good pay, and also some protection for the workers, so things like that. So it's about 52 indicators that we have to really determine whether a certain area or a certain management unit is geared towards sustainable price development. So, I guess we will not be crafting any to, but we will be using that also in measuring the, the as far as the red plus project is concerned. But of course, we would be adding, I guess, in terms of how much carbon is being is being absorbed. You know, that is one one thing that I guess we have not included yet in the in the SFEM. But I guess that should be included there. So. And also some methodologies the, for measuring carbon problems, those, those things. So I guess the, the climate change um, indicators <laughs> were not included yet on, on, the, on that existing tools. So probably we could enhance that so that we will not be formulating a new one. Thank you. But I have a question. That was just a follow-up of uh, your earlier question. My question has to do with, well, thank you, and I'm impressed with the comprehensive program that was presented. Now, uh, what came to mind was, uh, and it's a 10-year program, 2009 to 2019. 2020. 2020. And uh, my question is, is the federal government funding all of these, or to what extent is there donor funding for this kind of program, or perhaps uh, there might, might have been earlier funding? Actually, um, we have we have some funding from for pilot projects for pilot, for pilot, pilot projects. And as I said, probably we have already ten ten pilot projects as far as the red class is concerned. But uh, we say we say that we, we we believe that with or without international funding, we we will go with this because this is really what should the the government is, should be doing. So uh, actually, uh, all actually, if, if you, if I, as far as I am concerned, what we are doing right now in the forest sector and in the DNR are really uh, contributory, contributory to this. So you know, and to the climate change. And I, I believe uh, that as far as 1990, we're already advocating for this climate change and adaptation things, but nobody listened. But right now, uh, everybody now feels the climate change is here and the effect of climate change is here. So that's why everybody is really into this and uh, not crafting different adaptation strategies and mitigation strategies. But I guess we are no more on the adaptation. But it's really we still be doing mitigation and mitigation. So, yeah. may, I, may I just follow up? How, uh, uh, how difficult? easy for the government to mainstream? For instance, if there, there is foreign funding for but Are you saying that the pilots were a donor funded? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, uh, is it easy now for the DNR to mainstream uh, from these pilots you know, uh, getting funding or getting the, the bureaucracy to now support and uh, mainstream finding? Uh, yeah. Actually, um, uh, that, that is a challenge for us because even at the structure that we are conceptualizing right now, we would like now to to really uh, engage some of the the sectors like um, the NGOs, the private sector, institutions, academics to be part of that structure and uh, so that uh, every <laughs> it will be materialized. But that is how we. We are conceptualizing it that every funding related to Red Plus should pass through that, through that uh, structure so that all the, all the results of those studies will be somehow um, deposited in one, in one institution in one, or one agency. So something like that. So that all of these studies will be housed or the result of those studies will, will be 
put into an analysis management thing, you know, for for everybody to to be shared and uh, probably replicate in other aesthetic areas. I guess we were able to uh, to have these partnerships already in place. So I hope that the the government or the DNR would really uh, go with this with this thing. You know? But uh, we believe that this can be done as we have the done it in the preparation of this national response strategy. Professor Dow, we have your hand up. Uh, okay, let's have Doctor. Thank you, uh, Forester Wagan. I am also a forester, but probably I'm older than you, so would I make some suggestions yes, based on my experience? Very much welcome, sir. Uh, for example, uh, you, you said uh, reforestation is a part of the RRED strategy. I would like to suggest that instead of planting only one species, three species, in the same area, you can plant more than one. For example, I tried in our private farm in Nagusan Su, Mindanao, uh, six species. Uh, well, the one species, Bagras for the communication electric posts, uh, Mangyu and Jemelina for furniture, uh, Alvisia Palcataria for national, pro natural pruning of these three species, and then below, we planted bananas and maguey, abaha. Because uh, to prevent or minimize the destruction of the caigineros and the smugglers and the natives in destroying the forest species, they can now uh, be, be the, the fruits of the banana and the fibers of the banana and the fibers of the baka can be given free. So they will have a livelihood and they will be busy in doing this <laughs> to make their life, lives uh, better than destroying the forest. And then, another one is this, uh, I think there is a plant of Malacanang to plant uh, rice and uh, other crops in the islands. I think uh, this is not very good. I suggest that this should be reforested rather than planting food crops because uh, the, the highlands and areas that have uh, very, what? very thin surface soil and the soil there is uh, not fit for production of uh, uh, crops, agricultural crops. So what is needed now is uh, implement, probably implement the, pro the program of uh, the two Cortes brothers, uh, Lino, Dr. Lino and uh, the other one, so that we enrich the area, the, the soil, and then plant. First, the smaller, the smaller species, the better of the big species. And then third, I suggest the DNR will be, what, more political in nature. In my experience in the logging industry, I was uh, in the government service, I was literally dismissed from the service by politicians. The politicians are almost almost be the consultants and owners and partners in the logging industry. So I suggest that, uh, well, try to, try to uh, advise the congressmen and the senators and the <laughs> governors and the mayors and the uh, politicians and the influential people to help in the preservation of the forest, conservation of the forest, and then I think uh, we professionals should uh, request the cooperation of the people of the Philippines that you be our agents in forest conservation. But when you observe anybody destroying the forest, tell us, or the police, or the army, so that we can, uh, what? If we cannot uh, convince, we can. <laughs> but there will be no more trouble because as long as there are uh, these people, undisciplined people, whew, very, very hard to conserve the forest. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Okay. Okay, um, thank you more for your um, uh, suggestions. And if you, the, 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 those things are well taken. Professor Lau. Actually, I'm not yet professor. <laughs> I'm still a student in UBL, uh, my major in animal science and my minor in bad life studies. Uh, I'm from Indonesia and I want to share, thank you for your sharing about the Philippines. And, uh, I want to share some uh, our experience in Indonesia about the forest uh, to uh, decrease the deforestation from, from the community. Uh, actually, I'm, uh, during your presentation, I'm waiting about the program, what will you do with the community? But I, I, get, I am not getting about it in there. So I want to share something, and maybe you can share too, what uh, will be done by the Philippines. Uh, Indonesia now, with the uh, Department of uh, Forestry, uh, connected with the uh, Agriculture Department, they, uh, we, we done some of our program, that the name is the uh, Empowering Village Community Around Forest. And we done there. Uh, with the community, with the group of the uh, animal uh, animal rising, or maybe with also, but uh, also with the uh, group of the farmer, we discuss with them that what we can do with the forest, and after that we give the uh, some funding to them to empowering them to improve their income uh, to make uh, like the farm rising around the forest, including like Mr. Professor uh, said that. Uh, place it some uh, farming banana, or maybe uh, they can use some part of the uh, forest that maybe for the electricity. So under electricity, we cannot do anything. So we uh, give it to the community to improve there. And uh, the funding is not give it to the, to the whole community, but the funding from the whole community it's uh, there for them, and they must give it back to us. Yeah. And we will give it to the, the community again. Yeah. So my first question, uh, what is the uh, real program about the community services? The second, I see your program is starting in 2009 up to 2020. One question, uh, many things happens, including in Indonesia. When one uh, ministry, maybe in Philippine secretary, have a program, after that, the next secretary changes. It's really difficult to make the program sit down and uh, still there. So, did you have the idea how we can keep our program it's still there and we can uh, have a sustainability of the program? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as far as the the, the Philippines is concerned, we are um, uh, adapting the community-based forest management strategy. And dealing with our people in the uplands, so we have a we have a program for that whereby we also, as it's like the Indonesians, we are we are empowering them, we are providing some capacity building activities, provision of uh, some technical inputs and technical assistance in the development of their areas, and also we really involve them as far as the management of forest is concerned. As a side, as I said a while ago. They are the priority for red plus strategies, and because whether we like it or not, a lot of people are already in the upland, and we just can't help but really manage them and be part of the development process and the management of our forest resources. We're giving them some technical assistance. In fact, in the, our upland agroforestry upland program, we provided them some some financial and technical assistance in the development of agroforestry the practice of uh, assisted natural regeneration, then how to take the tree plantation, and also some like goods. So we are also providing that. But like I said, with, um, uh, we're giving some assistance to them in these areas. And we also try this approach of um, having them partner with some of the private sector so that uh, their areas would, would be developed because the, the problem of the community city and the upland farmers are the lack of uh, uh, financial finances to really develop the area. So our, we are doing it and uh, uh, hopefully we could really uh, uh, help in the 
alleviation of their of their situation. So we're doing that under the community based forest management program. So, uh, in terms of the sustainability of of these programs and initiatives that we have, I guess you're right there because um, uh, you're right and you're experiencing it especially in the DNR because uh, uh, for the last last year last Decade, last decade, we have, I guess, uh, a change uh, of secretaries every year. So you could just imagine the, the change in the priority direction of the DNR. And uh, um, we, uh, we are we are now um, uh, finalizing uh, or we are advocating for the passage of the sustainable forest ecosystem ecosystem, ecosystem management bill and hopefully uh, since it is a it is already a bill or an act it will not be changed changed uh, by the change in the administration you know the the bill is now at the senate and the college of forestry and um but uh society of philippine foresters and uh, Senior city senior foresters <laughs> are really um, put their efforts and their knowledge in the crafting of this uh, of this sustainable forest management act. So I hope this would uh, somehow lessen the change in the policies in the DNR, considering that it's a it's an act. So we could not um, change it uh, in a in a day or, or by just the stroke of the pen. So, but you're right. Uh, also suffer from from that from the change in in policy with the change in the with the change in the administration. So, but I guess right now since our secretary is a forester, so we, he can uh, he can um, he he can understand the more the the foresty the foresty sector. Please with us, please. Any more questions from our audience? Dr. Nessa? Uh, thank you, Lodi, for that uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, can you enlighten us further what could happen to the Philippines if we do not have a red plus strategy? Uh, what are we going to miss out on if we do not have a red plus strategy? And second is, I keep on seeing uh, in some of your slides, Code Red. Uh, could you explain to us what Code Red is about? Yes. Okay. So code Red Muna. A Code Red is a, is a, is a group of uh, NGOs and private uh, practitioners who form themselves together to help us in crafting this national red plus strategy. So those are the, the people who, who are which are pro communities also. So that's why code red. So, so as, uh, what shall we miss if we if we will not go into the red class? I guess we will be missing um you know um how shall I say <laughs> how shall I try again? Okay, Glo uh, climate change is a is is not only in the Philippines. It's a global global thing, you know. And uh, I guess we should also be in line with what is happening in the in the global in the global forum. So, since uh, the the global communities are now into red plus red plus, although uh, a lot of discussions are still going on at the at the UNFCC. Um, but I guess we should be in also in line with the with what is happening in the global in the global scene. So uh, since uh, there's still an ongoing discussion at the national at the global level, we in the Philippines would like to start it up now and doing some of the these things, the pilot testing, all of this, so that when it will be finalized, the Philippines will be ready for that with, with the red plus with the red plus things, you know. So. That's why we are doing these things now and in preparation for for the things that will come out globally. So I guess I guess so that we will not be left behind when the when the red plastic will be in full blown implementation already. And I guess we will also benefit from that because of the the learnings 
from those pilot projects, but whether it will be pushed or not, you will still be gaining from those uh, experiences that we will be deriving from piloting these projects because we will still be uh, using this in our pro pro existing programs and projects that we have in the DNR or in the Philippines for that matter. So I guess we will still benefit from it, from, from those uh, initiatives. Okay, so that's all the time we have for questions. If you have additional questions for Forrest or well, then you can approach her at the end of our program. If you need to uh, take a closer look at her uh, presentation, a PDF copy of it will be uploaded in the CIRCO website later this week. Can we please give another round of applause for Forrest or well?